March 2nd, 1929, Herbert Hoover had just been elected president. On the following Tuesday, he'd be inaugurated. The country was about to fall off the cliff into the Great Depression, and prohibition was in full swing. But on this Saturday, in a corner bedroom of a small farmhouse off a dirt road, in the middle of the piney woods of East Texas, a young woman named Flora, just days after her 19th birthday, gave birth to twin girls, Louise and Eloise. Eloise would become my mother. The girls rode out the Great Depression, mostly at their grandfather's farm, where they loved running through the woods and splashing through the creek, getting dirty. They hated sitting still, and they hated to be told what to do. They were tomboys, a word that we used to use, but we know now that that's not, that's not uh, germane. Uh, at the beginning of World War II, their father uh, left the family and joined the Navy Seabees, and he wouldn't return. Not because he was a casualty of the South Pacific, but because he was a casualty of Southern California. After the war in Los Angeles, he met a blonde named Barbara and decided to stay there and raise a new family because that was his prerogative. He was a man. And uh, the twins, my mom and her sister, were learning that it was a man's world. After high school, my mother moved to the big city of Houston. And for a while, she was doing great. She had uh, jobs as a secretary, work that she enjoyed and that she did well. And she had her own apartment, and it was the 1950s. And things were going pretty well for her until she met and married my father in uh, 1959, because married women in Texas were second-class citizens by law. They couldn't enter a contract by themselves. They couldn't buy a car if they wanted to. They couldn't own property. If my mother had an inheritance, it went to my father, because it was a community property state, and husbands controlled the community property. His signature was needed on everything that, that she had to do, that she would want to do legally. An attorney in Dallas named Louise Raggio said that women in Texas had the same rights as infants, idiots, and felons. But she helped change that. And in 1967, she wrote legislation that would become the Matrimonial Property Act of 1967. And my mother enjoyed that for a few years. I was born in 68, and uh, she was uh, a married woman with these new rights until she divorced in the early 70s. And she was a, a single woman again, a single divorced woman. And I saw growing up firsthand sexism and discrimination, especially in the workplace, against my mother. Um, I saw her quit jobs that she enjoyed because men harassed her. Uh, I saw her lose a job. She was fired because a man blamed her for something he had done but he was a prominent white man in the community and she was just a divorced woman. You know, sales clerks would ignore her or belittle her. Even her own preacher at a small United Methodist church shamed her more than once in front of the congregation when he reminded her of her sin of being a divorced woman. It was as if he was the Old Testament incarnate. Ultimately, my mom took a very low-paying job as a care provider for women with disabilities. It didn't challenge her creatively or intellectually, and I don't think it really satisfied her. But she didn't have to work with men. So when my daughter, Ella, was born in 2004, 75 years after my mother was born in the little farmhouse, I was determined to instill in Ella the belief that she was just as good as anybody else, smarter and more capable than most, and that her possibilities were endless. It didn't take long for this notion to be challenged. She was uh, just a year old and growing fast and needing new pajamas. So I went into the department store, into the girls' section, and there was a big round rack full of cute little sets of pajamas, and they were all pink and yellow. And Ella was already showing a preference for blue. 
And I'm wondering, who are these people that have told my daughter that she has two choices? She can either wear pink or yellow because she's a girl. And I looked across the aisle and there was another round rack equally full of cute little pajamas and they were all blue and green because it was the boys section. Boys couldn't wear pink or yellow. Well, Ella got a pair of blue pajamas that day. Growing up, she showed equal interest in playing outside in high fashion. She loved sitting in the grass, catching frogs, finding insects, splashing in mud puddles. Sometimes we made those mud puddles for her. Her mom did, especially. Because she loved it. But she also loved dressing up and playing with her dolls. When she was eight years old, I taught her to mow the yard. I guarantee you, we lived in Birmingham, Alabama at the time, I guarantee you she was the only little girl in Birmingham, Alabama pushing a lawnmower. And she did so in her purple snow boots because they were fashionable and f functional. One of, my, um, one of my favorite stories Ella told me when I picked her up from middle school one day, her English teacher had a contest between the boys and the girls in the class and Ella helped carry the girls to victory. And she was really proud of, of the win. She loved winning. This kid is incredibly competitive. But after that class, she had to pass by one of the boys she had beaten. And he nudged the kid next to him and pointed at Ella and said, she's a feminist. <laughs> and at first I thought, okay, we've done something right. But I don't think her mom or I raised Ella specifically to be a feminist. I think that's a, that's a label that she can choose to accept for herself if she wants. But we did raise her to be strong and smart and just and unapologetic for her skills and her talents. But that's, that's enough for me. Why don't we hear from Ella? Ella, you there? Yes, hello. Hi. Let's go ahead and hear you uh, while we work on seeing you. Okay. Sounds good. How are you doing? Ella is a first-year student at the University of Richmond. and she, or Are you in a library this morning? Yes, I am. Well, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Why don't you share some of your thoughts about, uh, about how you were raised? Certainly. As a child, you first learn societal norms through your parents. However, throughout my childhood, I witnessed my parents constantly defying standard gender roles set by previous generations. They both had jobs, they both cooked dinner, they both had did household chores, and they both worked outside in the lawn. I didn't even know this wasn't the standard family format until I was introduced to the media through TV, movies, and even the ads I saw on television. As a mud-playing kid, who was also a ballerina fashionista, I had never been told I could only do one thing, could only participate in one way. So when I asked my parents one Christmas for a football, they did not wonder why their little girl wanted a pigskin instead of a Barbie or a new outfit for her American Girl doll. Instead, they looked forward to the opportunity for me to build new skills and the lesson that football is not just for boys. When I learned how to mow the lawn, I added my own personal flair to it in the form of my favorite shoes at the time, <laughs> sparkly purple snow boots, which I quickly filled up with sweat in the Alabama heat. <laughs> Whether this was a conscious decision to challenge the traditional gender roles by my parents or just a way to farm out labor, I don't know. Probably both. Perhaps it is because of this dichotomy of my activities and toys that when I was introduced to 60s sitcoms, I connected with both the female and male characters. When Mary Tyler Moore's Laura Petrie burned dinner, I knew how she felt from my, though limited at this time, forays into cooking. When John Wayne's characters had to bite the bullet and get through a rough time, 
I recognized that same stubborn grit as the determination that I had to draw upon at the end of my gymnastics classes to get through the time when it would be so easy to just drop on the floor that I had to get my kip up on the bar. Though these characters represented stereotypical gender roles, I was able to connect with both of them because to me, the world had never been that black and white. Why couldn't a woman shoot her way out of trouble? Why couldn't a woman be a writer for a primetime television show? Why couldn't a woman? It's a question that I've never had to ask. And I hope that I never will. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Ella. That's very, very well said. Very well said. And I'm just really proud that just a generation removed from, from my mother when women's roles and their lives were often defined for them, sometimes by law, you know, Ella is defining her own life. Thanks very much.